Welcome to Video Edition. Coming up on this episode, we'll be joined by attorney Jared Ferentino, who will present the Ask the Solicitor segment. He'll be highlighting the rules around motions and whether a legislative body can proceed with discussion before an item has a motion. Also on this episode, we're joined by Senator Wayne Langerholk, Republican Senator for the 35th District, about his recently introduced Senate Bill 73 and the mandate waiver program for school districts. And finally, as always, John Callahan's with us to offer a recap of last week's goings on in the Capitol and what to look for in the week ahead. Can discussion occur before an item has a motion or should the legislative body wait until a first and second motion are made? Technically, under Robert's rules of order, discussion is out of order unless there's been a motion and a second on that motion when required. The chairperson would then call the question and place it before the legislative body and then discussion can occur. However, in committees and small boards, you may employ relaxed Roberts rules and that would allow for some discussion on a particular issue if it's anticipated that that issue is going to come up. However, it's very important for chairpersons of committees and boards to maintain a certain degree of order in your meetings. Even though you can employ relaxed rules, we recommend that you find a way to allow issues to be addressed in an orderly and organized fashion. That's important for keeping minutes. It's also important for keeping and respecting everyone's opinions on a particular issue and presenting them in an organized, cohesive way. We're joined now by Senator Langerholk. Uh, Senator, Senate Bill 73, something you recently introduced that creates a mandate waiver for school districts. Tell us a little bit about the legislation and, and why you thought it was important to tackle this. Uh, yes, I mean, over uh, the past year, we've seen a uh, kind of a common thread here across the Commonwealth and kind of highlighted by the pandemic just to allow uh, local leaders to make local decisions uh, because we felt that they knew their communities the best across a wide range of spectrums. And uh, that, that, this legislation uh, will do that. It'll allow for local school districts to make decisions and then ultimately apply for uh, waivers uh, to help the individual district. And, and, but more importantly, to help the students, because there's, there's a lot of different uh, needs across that that aren't, there's not a, you know, a cookie cutter approach to things. So we wanted to, to allow the local decisions to be made uh, to help, make the districts, make it easier for the districts to do that. So, so let, me, let me ask you, because you mentioned the pandemic and last year, the legislature created a temporary mandate waiver program that was part of the emergency pandemic legislation. What's the difference now in terms of, of that temporary waiver versus what you're trying to accomplish in this legislation? This will be a permanent, uh, permanent program instead of just a temporary. There were some bills that we passed, you know, in the highlight of this, I can recall back when this all kind of reared its ugly head back uh, in March, I think it was actually even Friday the 13th in March that uh, it kind of went downhill uh, and you know, schools were closed. And then it kind of just little did we know what we faced uh, at that point or what would we would face. Now we're coming up on, you know, we're uh, less than a month away from it being a year. And one of the first things that we did as I met, with, you know, at that time I was the chair, of the uh, Senate Education uh, Committee. And then we met with our local superintendents here within the 35th district, as well as statewide to see what concerns, how we could get a package of bills out to help them in the short term, because this was, you know, we were kind of, I hate to use that analogy, you know, flying the plane as we build it. But I mean, it was, you know, it's kind of apropos that, and that's what we were doing, trying to get input from different stakeholders. How do we address? And that was one of the, the issues that came out. So we wanted the package of bills we were able to kind of get out uh, in the short term to help uh, effectuate real, real and positive change. And this just kind of builds off of that and uh, makes it a, uh, a permanent program. Well, now with, within, I, I want to ask you a little more about the, the ability to, to utilize those waivers. You're certainly going to hear from people saying, well, there are some mandates that are, that are pretty sensitive or they're controversial. You look at health and safety requirements, that sort of thing. How does the bill go about addressing those kinds of issues? Uh, it, it will... And we were, we were aware of that and it will require the districts to provide, this isn't just a blanket approach that so you do this and it's, you know, it's good. I mean, this will require uh, 
support data to be uh, to be given, uh, and and ultimately, uh, you know, what, what what are the expected benefits of the waiver, and then ultimately would have to be adopted by a resolution, <clears throat> excuse me, by the governing board during a regularly scheduled meeting, okay. and also allow for public comment. So I mean, this isn't just a uh, you know blanketed approach, but it would. Uh, and also, I, I will mention that it does not allow for certain chapters of the education code to be waived. So this isn't just kind of like a you know, let's bring the Wild West back to the Commonwealth here. Sure. <laughs> this is this is about uh, certain instances where th there will be the proper checks and balances and due process that will be afforded. So you're really looking at uh, some areas covered. Obviously, you, you've said some areas of the education code will still be under the purview of the General Assembly and will be. Uh, not able to be waived, but a district in a regular legislative session where they pass a resolution, kind of check all the boxes of your legislation and say, you know, here's the justification, here's the data to prove it. Uh, that would feed into their ability in certain circumstances to actually waive certain mandates. Am I getting that kind of right? That's yeah, that's pretty right. accurate. So obviously very important for school districts, school boards that are looking for the ability to, to do right by local students and to uh, to, to make sure that, that uh, there aren't unnecessary mandates that are burdening them and keeping them from advancing. But how can a school director or a school board right now support this kind of effort? What, what can they do to jump on board and, and get behind this? Uh, continue to advocate uh, to you know, individuals like myself, your state senators, your state representatives, and, and uh, we can assist in you know, their ability to, to do this. And whatever we can do, we'll continue to advocate for them, uh, uh, you know, on their behalf. Great. Well, Senator, thank you so much. Bill uh, 73 is uh, introduced by Senator Langerholk. Uh, important for uh, districts to be able to waive some uh, local mandates. We appreciate the time and, and all of your efforts on behalf of uh, school districts across the state, Senator. Thank you, glad to help. Hello, this is Annette Stevenson, Chief Communications Officer for PSVA, and also with me is John Callahan, Chief Advocacy Officer, who is going to join us and talk about what's going on in Harrisburg. Thanks for being with us, John. Thank you, Annette. The, the biggest story um, that happened last week is vaccines, and we've been pushing for the past, oh, five weeks, six weeks, it seems like forever, um, on vaccines and getting vaccines into teachers and educators' arms anybody who really interacts with our, our students in order to get us back or one cl step closer to being back full-time in buildings. Um, and that has been a struggle between us and the administration, Department of Health, and, and we've, we've also talked to our, our friends in the legislature. And finally, last week, um, the governor uh, made an announcement along with a, a task force uh, involved with COVID response um, made the announcement that vaccines will be delivered to educators in the next weeks, uh, this week, maybe even this week, but the next weeks. Uh, and we're going to get the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. We're going to get it in the teacher's arms. So very good news overall um, for getting us closer to being fully physically open. That's fantastic to hear. And so that's going to impact the educational professionals that are at the school in the buildings that are interacting with students? In the buildings, there's some stipulations about, um, you know, who gets it first, you know, K through, uh, you know, the, the younger grades, I should say, okay. and, and also special education. And some of, uh, we're also looking at bus drivers. We're also looking at cafeteria workers and so forth. Those people that interact with our students. Um, so the priority is there. Uh, thanks to the National Guard, we're going to be deploying it with their help. Uh, and getting it really it, over the next few weeks right into the teacher's arms. And this is really one that's a one-shot vaccine, uh, so they don't have to go back for multiple shots. And, um, you know, again, it's all about getting us one more step to making our buildings safer, our, our, our communities uh, feel uh, better about the, you know, being in school. Uh, so I mm -hmm. think, you know, we're, we're on our way. And, um, you know, we're glad to have this. We expect over 90,000 uh, doses to be out there very shortly and more to come. That's great news. And I imagine the school leaders will be making decisions about how that might even impact the remainder of this year, perhaps. Yes, and, and there was one other piece of uh, information that came along with uh, the announcement from the governor that I should mention regarding the categories of uh, whether you need to be hybrid, open, or uh, completely virtual. Uh, there was some slight changes in, 
and basically the indicators for making those decisions. So please take a look at the PDE website. And if you want more information on the vaccination uh, program itself, we at PSBA sent out a, an alert to all the members on PDE's website. So the information's out there. Your superintendents are already acting on this now. Um, and the wheels are already in motion to really get the uh, shots in arms. Great to hear. So you've got Advocacy Day coming up uh, at the towards the end of this month. Do you have anything to highlight on that? Well, we are excited. There's over 150 uh, individuals registered. I think we're going to blow and keep on blowing past that number and keep on maybe going to 200. Um, but we're going to have a lot of people active and members who sign up can be active in any way they want to. They can write a letter, they can make a phone call, or they can participate in a meeting. And by the way, we set up all your meetings for you, so you don't even have to worry about that. We also give you talking points and all the information you need um, in order to kind of make those um, advocacy asks to your legislators. So, you know, it's so easy to do it. Uh, just register and be a part of it. And, and it's a small time commitment. It can be a large time commitment, but really, um, it shouldn't really be that stressful. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we've made it so easy. Uh, you just register and we do all the work and, and you can uh, just be a, a, an advocate that, that day and not worry about anything else. And did you say, how many do we have registered so far? We're over 150. Um, That's awesome. I am also to get to over 200. Um, Jamie Zuvers, our grassroots coordinator is making all these appointments. So 200 would probably blow her mind, but hey, I think we're gonna do it. Um, and we just have so many members participating and there, there's so many things we need to talk to our legislators about. So, you know, join, you know, go on the website, PSBA's website. It's right on the, the banners at the top, sign up right through those uh, banners and, and uh, join us that day. And the more voices we have, just kind of the more we can be heard, right? On these issues. Yeah, and it's all about coordinating our messages and being there. The legislators really listen when they're, when the message is done in mass. And that's what we're working on. Great. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Once again, every week you bring us a great update. So thank you for that. Thanks, Annette. There are so many topics for school leaders to stay apprised of. PSBA's Legislative Edition newsletter is one way to stay closely connected to the updates on legislation that impacts public schools. We also release special Closer Look publications, which take a deeper dive into specific legislative topics so you can be well-versed as you go into your board meetings. Be sure to look out for PSBA communications in your inbox. We know it's tough to find the time to read and stay current on everything, and that's why we try to narrow down the focus for you so you don't miss out on PSBA important news through our social media updates and newsletters. We appreciate you tuning in today. Hope you have a great week. Thanks for watching. And remember, PSBA is here supporting you as you support our community.